I know Pastor Metzola just now said to us, God gave him fantastic word, Behold, I set before you an open door. Three successive years, God spoke to him about, Behold, I set before you an open door. This young preacher likewise was praying very hard, all right, about the first sermon he was preaching in this church. So he thought he also used the words of Jesus. Instead of saying, Behold, all right, I set before you an open door, he thought the words of Jesus, Behold, I'm coming soon. Behold, I'm coming soon. It will be a great sermon to start preaching in his sermon. And so he was told in his preaching class, okay, in seminary, okay, that what happens, you must always start with a punchline, okay, and announce it with all your gusto. Behold, I'm coming soon. And so what happens is he was told, you step forward a few steps and announce the word of the Lord for all of you this evening. My sermon is, Behold, I'm coming soon. And then, my goodness, he forgot the next line, what to say. And then he was told in the preaching class in seminary to stand back, to take three steps backward and start all over again. And that's what he did, start all over again. Behold, I'm coming soon. He forgot about it again. Then he was told, try the third time. He tried the third time. Behold, I'm coming soon. But what happens is the third time, he stepped a bit too much in front. He tripped over. He rolled over. He knocked over the poor lady on the front row. And the lady fall on top of, 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 of him. Okay? And they both struggled from their seats and that kind of thing like this. And the young man was very, very apologetic to this old lady. I'm sorry, ma'am. I'm so, I don't mean to. I'm so sorry. It was so rude of me to do this kind of thing to this wonderful, wonderful lady like this. The old lady dusted herself and said, Young man, it is not your fault. You have given me three warnings. <laughs> but I didn't know you were going to come so soon. <laughs> How many of us? We work hard or we think we work hard. Can I see your hands? Wow. How many of us hardly work? Now don't put up your hands. <laughs> and there's a reality for all of us in life that you notice, friends. Apostle Paul is concerned to share with all of us. And that in this passage of scripture, we notice, friends, Apostle Paul is unafraid to share with us really his labor for the church. Really the whole area of how hard he actually worked for the church that he was involved, right? some of which in planting, some of which through others, like right? in the case of the church in Colossae, to Epaphras, that the church was planted a disciple of his. And Paul now shares about his labor for the church in terms of three areas. Firstly, friends, he talks about his sufferings. Apostle Paul talks about his sufferings in this man in verse 24. Let's read together again. Now I rejoice in what was suffered for you, and I fill up in my flesh what is still lacking in regard to Christ's afflictions. For the sake of his body, which is the church. In an amazing manner, Paul says, Now I rejoice in what was suffered for you. Friends, if you remember, all right, I preached on Christmas, uh, sorry, Easter weekend about the whole era of sufferings, isn't it? And Apostle Paul tells us, therefore, in this regard here, about him rejoicing in sufferings. It blows our minds, isn't it? How can we rejoice in sufferings? Suffering is something that is bad, something that we should avoid. And yet, Apostle Paul says he rejoiced in it. How can we rejoice in it? Friends, it is all to do with our response to sufferings. If we respond wrongly, we'll be crippled by it. We'll make useless by it. Like some people, because of some sufferings they face in life, they get angry with God, right? They get bitter with God and want to have nothing to do with God and God's people. We can respond like this, friends. On the other hand, sometimes we don't know why we are suffering. But we trust God. We want to believe that this God is a good God. And we want to believe, friends, that at the end of it all, God brings good out of it. Why? Because Romans 5 tells us, suffering produces perseverance. Perseverance, character, and character, hope, isn't it? In us, friends, you know, when you and I respond correctly to sufferings, it makes us a better person and never, never a bitter person. It is all to do with our attitude, friends, towards it. Our attitude would either cause us to soar or actually will cause us to really fall, all right, and become useless for the Lord. We can rejoice like the Apostle Paul because when we respond correctly to sufferings and with the right attitude, friends, we know that God is perfecting our character, making us a better person. Okay, good amen for that, isn't it? That's the reason why, friends, we can rejoice because the right attitude, because the right response, that we know that God is molding us and making us a better person. Not only we notice, friends, Apostle Paul says he rejoiced in his sufferings, 
but also he says his ongoing sufferings for Christ is on behalf of the church. That it is for the church of Jesus Christ that at the end of it all he's suffering. Let's go back again that verse of scripture. Paul writes in this manner, Now I rejoice in what I suffered for you, for I fill up in my flesh what is still lacking in regard to Christ's afflictions for the sake of his body, which is the church. Paul said Paul is suffering for the sake of the church, for the sake of the body of Christ right, that he gave himself to. Now friends, when we read this verse of scripture, it may seem to appear right, that Paul writes in this manner, for I fill up in my flesh what is still lacking in regard to Christ's afflictions. What is still lacking in regard to Christ's afflictions. On the surface of it, it may appear as if the sufferings of Christ on earth, when he was on earth, wasn't adequate, wasn't sufficient. It appears on the surface, we read it, all right, that I fill up in my flesh what is still lacking in regards to Christ's sufferings. But this is not the understanding of Scripture. Why? Because the sufferings of Christ is adequate, is completely sufficient for all time and eternity. Again, good amen for that, amen. isn't it? It's very, very important. It is not saying to us that the suffering of, of Christ is not sufficient, is still incomplete, and that we need to suffer. And that's the reason why, friends, when we interpret Scripture wrongly, we find that some people from certain traditions would during Easter whip themselves until they become bloody, some will even want to crucify themselves on the cross. It is not uncommon to see, isn't it? Pictures of this, all right? Around the world, especially in the Philippines, you see some people during Easter period would go to the cross as it were through these sufferings, right? They think that this is going to obtain their merits. This is going to make them a better person. It isn't, friends. Christ's sufferings on the cross is complete, is sufficient, is totally adequate. Can you good amen for that? Just that in Paul's sufferings on earth, Okay, it is like Jesus sharing with us his afflictions. Because when, when the body of Christ suffers, it is like the Lord Jesus Christ suffering with us, isn't it? It is like Christ really walking with us, okay, in the afflictions and pains and the sufferings we go through. And that's the reason, my friends, when Apostle Paul is suffering, he's suffering, all right, continuing on, as it were, the afflictions of Christ on earth because of the church. And therefore, the same thing applies for all of us, friends. When we are suffering, we know the Lord Jesus Christ is concerned. Can a good amen for that, isn't it? Jesus is concerned when his body is persecuted around the world. And therefore, we are sharing, as it were, in the earthly afflictions of Christ when we are suffering for the sake of the gospel, when we are suffering for the church. In a real sense, friends, we thank God for Apostle Paul's sufferings like this. It is as a result of his sufferings and afflictions. That's how, friends, you and I have the letter to the Colossians. Because... Had Paul not suffered, he wouldn't have written this letter from the prison in Rome, isn't it? It is out of the afflictions for the body of Christ. He was in prison, and out of the imprisonment in Rome, friends, Apostle Paul wrote the letter right, to the Colossian Christians like this. And that's why Paul shares with us honors of his labor in terms of suffering right, for the church of Jesus Christ. And you and I, friends, when we suffer, we also know we are carrying on the afflictions of Jesus on earth, as it were, until one day when it shall all be over, when Jesus Christ in glory and in power. Can good amen for that, isn't it? That's the first thing, friends, that Paul shares with us about his labor, his labor in terms of sufferings. Secondly, friends, Paul shares with us his labor in terms of his servanthood. Why? Because in verse 25, this is what we read like this. Together again, friends, let's read. I have become its servant by the commission God gave me to present to you the word of God in its fullness. Paul shares with us that he was in commission as a servant. And therefore, friends, you know, Apostle Paul is called to be a servant, a servant to advance the gospel, a servant really to advance the kingdom of God, isn't it? And that's why, friends, because Paul follows and really, in a sense, models himself after the Lord Jesus Christ, who came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Therefore, you and I, friends, who are followers of Christ, we are also servants of Christ, and all the servants say, isn't it? giving ourselves to serve. And that's very important. That's what we seek to do here in Due MC. We seek to train, to equip, to raise us all to be servants of Christ, isn't it? That there are no bosses here, that we are all servants for Christ, isn't it? And we give ourselves joyfully, happily to serve King Jesus as the body of Christ like this here in DMC. And so that's a call, friends, of Apostle Paul to be a servant, 
Not only is he called to be a servant, we find that Paul is called to proclaim that mystery. This amazing ministry, uh, the mystery that Apostle Paul is called to proclaim. What is it? It tells us in verses 26 and 27. All right, in this manner, let's read together. The mystery that has been kept hidden for ages and generations, but is now disclosed to the sins. To them, God has chosen to make known among the Gentiles the glorious riches of this mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. It's amazing, friends. Apostle Paul says this mystery. Now, normally, how many of you have been to a mystery trip? For example, you get onto a ship on a boat. It takes you, it doesn't tell you the destination. You just get on. You have joy, you have fun, you have laughter, you have adventure. All right? A mystery cruise, mystery train ride. How many have been on mystery trips? Can I see your hands? Only one. My goodness. You are not very adventurous people. I like to go on mystery trips because it doesn't know where it takes you to. So once when I was a student in England, I decided to jump on a train because it says mystery trip. So I bought the ticket because the mystery trip is very cheap. All right, British Rail, very expensive. Okay, but because it's mystery, okay. Bought it, hop on it, don't know where the train is going to take us to. Finally, when it landed, I was looking, my goodness, what is this city? Looked around, walked around, finally found it is Lincoln, the city of Lincoln, a lovely city. But for a very, very cheap amount of money, which all Malaysians love. I said it. Because Malaysians are clever people. Always want good deals, not only good deals, but cheap deals. Hello? Isn't it? And so it is great to just go on mystery trips to discover for yourself what is it like. But friends, mystery as we normally understand it is something that we do not know. Something yet to be discovered. But friends, the Christian mystery, the Christian mystery is one that is known. All right, and the mystery here that Apostle Paul says to us is Christ in you, the hope of glory. This mystery is not hidden anymore. It has been revealed, it has been exposed, and it's been exposed in Jesus Christ, that Christ in you, the hope of glory. Now, friends, you know, that phrase, Christ in you, is an important phrase. Critical for you and I who are Christians. Christ in you. Why is this the case? The first thing, friends, is because it produces in us a new identity. A new amazing identity in all of us. You can fill in the blanks in the notes that I've given in the insert in the bulletin. In what manner it produces in us a new identity in Christ? Why? Because 2 Corinthians 5.17 says this. Church, let's read together. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has gone, the new has come. When we are in Christ, friends, we become a new creation. We become a new person. We take on a new identity. And this is so important for all of us. Why is it so important? Because, friends, the thing is, is all of us in the world, we are always asking the question, who am I? How many of you have asked this question before in your life? See your hands? Right? It's a normal question. Some of the philosophical questions we all ask for every one of us, young or old, we ask, who am I? Why am I here? What am I doing? Where am I going? And also, where do I belong? Very important question for all of us, or questions for all of us. For example, where do I belong? How many of you remember the song, Nobody's Child? It's really a very popular song. It was top of the pops in the 60s or something like this, whatever. Okay? All right? And the chorus goes like this. Okay? Uh, Those who can join me, is it okay? Let's try and see whether we we can still do it or not. Okay? I'm nobody's child. I'm nobody's child. Just like a flower, I am growing wild. No mummy's kisses and no daddy's smile. Nobody wants me. I'm nobody's child. Wow, not bad, huh? <laughs> Those of you who could sing, you have just betrayed your age. <laughs> really. That's one sister in a, in a young adults, okay? A Mac group that I mentor. She says, I also know this. I'm shocked because it's a young working adult. I say, how do you know? How do you know this song? He says, she says, because my father sings this all the time. Ah, now I know why like that. I'm nobody's child. 
I'm nobody's child. I'm just like a flower growing wild. No mommy's kisses, no daddy's smile. I am nobody, nobody's child. That's the worst thing, friends, isn't it, for a child who doesn't belong anywhere. That's why he or she is a nobody's child. We are all looking, friends, for belonging. We are all looking for relationship and friendship. We are all looking for identity in life. Who am I? And sometimes we think, my identity is to do with the car I drive, the house I live in. Not just that. Also, even where I live, the neighborhood I live, the job I hold, the people I hang around with, the restaurants and places I frequent, even how I smell, how I look, and what I wear. We think this is our identity. And sometimes we really want to stamp our identity in terms of what? Wearing earring, nose ring, whatever rings all over the place, and paint our, our hair in all kinds of color. Friends, you know, human beings wrestle and struggle with it. And we think that this is what makes me who I am. Friends, no, it is so sad. And that's how the world values people. That's how the world measures people. By the car you drive, by the home you live in, by places you go, by what you wear, how you look, and also even how you smell. Friends, for you and I who are Christians, we are delivered from all this. We are totally delivered from all this. Why? Because our identity is in Christ. But because when we are in Christ, we are a new creation. All things have passed. New things have come. We are accepted by Christ. We are precious to Christ. We are important to Christ. We are significant in Christ. Can you good amen for that? And therefore, we don't need these things to make me who I am. We don't need any of these. We are freed, friends, totally freed from the bondage of people to the world. That unless I have this, I own this, I wear this, and, uh, and, 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 and I, I hold this job, it, is, it makes me somebody. Otherwise, I'm nobody. Friends, no. The amazing thing for you and as Christians is that our identity is in Christ. Can we get amen for that? And that's what, friends, Apostle Paul is trying to tell you and I. Christ in you, the hope of glory. That's our identity, Christ in us. Not only that, friends, it promises a new hope. The hope is that Christ in us, the hope of glory, isn't it? The amazing, friends, the amazing truth of it all, that in Christ there is a hope of glory. In Christ, better things are ahead. The best is yet to come, isn't it? In other words, friends, you know what? Not only Christ, we notice here, when we're in Christ, it produces in us a new identity, it promises a new hope, but also it provides for us a new future, a great future, a fantastic future that we don't have to worry at all about, isn't it? Because when we have Christ in us, we are safe and secure. It does not matter whether I live or I die, because if I die, I gain, isn't it? That's what Apostle Paul says, Philippians 1.21, for me to live is Christ, but to die is gain, isn't it? And that's why for a Christian, he lives freely. He lives in an amazing manner, not under bondage to the things of the world and the expectations of the world. And that's the way, friends, Apostle Paul wants you and I to understand that he's willing to labor in all these. Why? Because out of that, hard work as a servant of Christ. He's able to proclaim this mystery, Christ in you, the hope of glory. So we notice, friends, Apostle Paul as a servant is not only called to be a servant, called to proclaim the mystery, Christ in you, the hope of glory. But third and finally, friends, Apostle Paul is called to present everyone mature in Christ. And so verse 28, Paul writes in this manner, let's read together. We proclaim him, admonishing and teaching everyone with all wisdom, so that we may present everyone perfect in Christ. Mature in Christ. That's the ultimate goal, friends, aim of what we seek to do. What Apostle Paul wants to do, to present everyone mature, complete in Christ. In what manner? Three manners that Apostle Paul tells us. Firstly, to the proclamation. Proclamation is speaking aloud, speaking forth, speaking to a big group. Like, for example, here, isn't it? And so, friends, here in DMC, our heart's desire is also likewise to prepare you, to help you to mature in the Lord Jesus Christ. Can you go amen for that, isn't it? We're going to present every one of you mature in Christ, complete in Christ, confident in Christ. All right, it comes through, firstly, proclamation. 
And that's why it is so important to come week after week here in church, isn't it? To hear the proclamation of God's word, to hear the word of God being taught. And you know, here in UMC, we're very particular. We teach from the Bible. We take us through book after book in the Bible like this. Why? Because it is the word of God that can make us strong, that can make us powerful in this world. Can good amen for that, isn't it? That's what we seek to do, friends, as a people of God, a proclamation. But also, we notice uh, admonishing. Admonishing, to admonish is to come close to counsel, to advise, to instruct, to correct, to do all that is needful to help you to be a better disciple of Christ, isn't it? So in a case of admonishing, it is now coming close. It is not speaking publicly aloud to everyone. It is now coming as close as we can, admonishing you, in directing you, in sometimes correcting you if necessary, isn't it? And so that's what we want to do. Right, besides coming for worship celebration like this week in and week out, and that's very important. Have a good amen for that, isn't it? For all of us. Secondly, it admonishing one another. But also thirdly, friends, teaching everyone with all wisdom. We have to teach. And church, can I say, you and I as Christians are the most privileged people on earth. Why is this the case? Because week after week we can come here to church to be taught. You know, in many places. People don't have the privilege to be taught week after week. You know that? Isn't it? In no other faiths, actually, people are taught the way you and I as Christians are taught. Can good amen for that? In no other way. You might have heard me say this before. A chairman of the Buddhist temple was invited here to join us in worship celebration by one of our church members. And of course, this person, very smart guy, a dato somebody, says to him, you know, my friend, uh, Mr. So and so, I'd like to invite you to come to this place called the Dream Center. He did not say come to my church. He just says come to a place called Dream Center. You sit in a meeting. He did not say sit in a worship service. You sit in a meeting. At the end of the meeting, you tell me what you think about the meeting. So he came. I was at the door shaking hands and was introduced to him. He said, Great to have you, Mr. Tan. Welcome. He sat in the meeting. All right. At the end, this friend went up to him and said, So, Mr. Tan, what do you think about it? He said, you know what? Next Sunday, I'm going to bring my son here. What does it mean? It means that he has seen this to be so good, so wonderful, all that he has seen and heard. I don't want my son to miss this great stuff that is here in Dream Center and all you people say. Isn't it? It is church after church all over the world. You and I have given amazing teachings, isn't it? To ground us well and to ground us strong. That's the concern of Apostle Paul. Teaching us with all wisdom, insights and understanding for all of us. And so, friends, you know, Paul labors for the church in terms of his sufferings and his willing to suffer for Christ. Paul labors for the church in terms of being a servant for the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ, that he wants to continue to do so. Third and finally, friends, Paul labors for the church in terms of his struggles, in terms of his struggles in life. And so Paul shares with us, and this man, in terms of his struggles, firstly, he says, with all the energy from Christ that is in him. And so verse 29, let's read together. To this end, I labor, struggling with all his energy, which so powerfully works in me. See, friends, Apostle Paul did not say, struggling with all the energy, all my energy, but struggling with all his energy, which so powerfully works in me. Friends, you know, as God's people, we are privileged that we don't have to wrestle and struggle on our own. Because if it is by our own energy, we won't last very long. And all those who agree say, okay, only 50% says, okay, agree, isn't it? That 50%, God bless you. You have amazing energy. But the reality is our human energy will always be insufficient. I'm very conscious, the older I grow, the more conscious I am, actually. So that many, many times I pray. And as you know, in the morning I pray, Lord, Right, with my hands raised before God, even just lying down before getting up from bed many, many times, Lord, come and fill me, anoint me, empower me. I need all the strength and energy from you to go through the day. How many of us, we know Christian work is hard work. Can I see your hands? That's why, friends, we all work hard and not we hardly work. Isn't it? It is hard work. Why is it hard work? Friends, can I say because we're building something that will last for all time and eternity. You know that? Everything else we involve in building will one day fade away. 
your companies, your organizations, your whatever else, all that you invest in, friends, will one day be gone. Only the kingdom of the Lord Jesus Christ will go on from strength to strength. Can a good amen for that, isn't it? And therefore, we're involved in building something that is everlasting. Of course, it is work and very hard work, isn't it? But friends, you know, it will never be wasted. Why? Because every ounce of energy we deploy ourselves in working, in serving, advancing God's kingdom, we're building something that will last forever and ever, isn't it? And that's why, friends, Apostle Paul shares with us very frankly that he's struggling, but struggling not with his own energy, struggling with his energy, Christ's energy that is in us, isn't it? And so that's a reality for all of us. I'm amazed myself, actually, honestly speaking, the older I grow, the fitter I feel. Really, the stronger I feel. All right? I don't sleep many hours, actually, in the day. Normally, four hours, I'm up, okay, and go through the day like this and that kind of thing. Of course, I go back and snooze for a while, but then I run around like crazy. I come back, okay, no jack leg. I press on, and Tuesday night, I'm off, all right, to UK, travel to the whole day like this, rush, and the next morning, I'm teaching in the whole church planting school. Next two days like this, and after Sunday, I'm preaching. Immediately after Sunday morning, Sunday evening, and then Monday, I rush off to LG. Bang, 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 it goes on like this. I know by myself it's impossible. But friends, with all the energy of Christ, it is possible. That's a reality for all of us. Friends, you know. That's why my good friend, Pastor Chu Wing Chi, that some of you know, he's not a young man anymore. All right? You know, he's 68 years old. I'm only 63. You know what? His hair is all black. His teeth is all real. He says, every part of me is authentic, you know? And you know what? He drinks Coca-Cola like crazy. Some of us got Coca-Cola, why? Right? Because all sugar, nothing else inside. And I tell you, you know what? Pilots, you know, pilots in our church who wear pilot aircrafts, you know, one of the pilots in our church says, Pastor, you know, we use a Coca-Cola, we pour on the windshield of aeroplane, and we scrub off all the dirt and the rubbish and everything else. Oh, so I told him that, you know what? He said, no wonder I'm so clean even on the inside. <laughs> With coke going through me, he cleaned up everything. All right. No wonder I'm so fit and strong. And he swims, all right, every week, 20 laps up and down like this. I said, you know what, Wenxi, you start a 120 club. Okay, I'm going to join your club, where we're all going to live 120 years old. How many want to join that club? See your hands. Wow, all the clever people here, okay? Provided one condition, I told him, provided we are all still fit, strong, and healthy. Can I see? How many want to join now? 120 clubs, still fit, strong, and healthy. Now, can I see? All clever Malaysians, isn't it? But friends, it's a reality for all of us. We press on, we wrestle on with the energy that Christ gives to us, isn't it? To fulfill the call of God for all of us. And that's why Zerubbabel was told by God, right, to Zechariah in this manner. Let's read together the well-known verse, Zechariah 4, 6 together. So he said to me, this is the word of the Lord to Zerubbabel, not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord Almighty. You see, it is not by human might nor by human power, but it is by the Spirit of God, isn't it? Why? Because when we operate by the Spirit of God and spiritual principles, we'll be strong, we'll be healthy, we'll be just amazing and fulfilling God's design and purpose. And God knows that. Because by ourselves, it is impossible to do His work, isn't it? And so He wants to release grace and anointing upon us to fulfill it. And so Paul shares with us about His labor, all right? His struggle with all the energy that is inspired by Christ in Him. Not only that Paul's concern, secondly, in his struggle is for the well-being of God's people. He wants to see that God's people will be well, will be strong. Verses 1 and 2 of chapter 2, it goes like this, let's read. I want you to know how much I'm struggling for you and for those at Laodicea and for all who have not met me personally. My purpose is that they may be encouraged in heart and united in love. That's the first concern, friends, of a Paul support in wrestling and struggling for the advance of God's kingdom. That a Paul support wants them to be encouraged in heart and united in love, isn't it? How many of us, we feel we need encouragement? See your hands. How many of us? All of us, isn't it? It is very important. When do you encourage? Why must you encourage? Who do you encourage? Hebrews chapter 3 tells us like this, and this is part of our daily Bible reading as we go to the Bible reading plan here in DMC. Hebrews 3 verses 12 and 13. Let's read together. See to it, brothers, 
that none of you has a sinful, unbelieving heart that turns away from the living God, but encourage one another daily as long as it is called today, so that none of you may be hardened by sin's deceitfulness. You see, the Apostle Paul talks about who, when, and why, isn't it? Who should be encouraged? Encourage one another. We all need encouragement. Good amen again, isn't it? All of us need encouragement. I need encouragement as well, isn't it? All of us, no matter how spiritual, no matter how many years we've been a Christian, every one of us need encouragement, and that's important. Not only that, when do we encourage, we are told here, but encourage one another daily. Daily. So friends, can I give you an assignment for all of us? Make this an assignment for our lives that every day, Go out and encourage somebody. Can a good amen for that? It's not a very, not a very, very, you know, committed amen. Okay, shall we all go out as an assignment from God in obedience to Scripture? Let's encourage at least one person every day. Can a good amen for that? Amen. Okay, that's important, isn't it? Just encourage somebody. Why? Because sometimes, friend, that one encouragement may make the whole day for that person. And sometimes that one encouragement, friends. You may even, you don't know, spare the person's life. You know that? Because sometimes a person is feeling hopeless and helpless. The person is feeling totally down. And the person is feeling whether is it worth it to carry on living? Is it really worth it living in this world? And you may be the next person coming alongside to give that person a word of encouragement. That might turn him, that might turn her around, isn't it? and totally change and transform that person. You never know. Listen, encourage one another. Who? One another. All of us. When? Daily. Today is the day, isn't it? But also, why do we encourage? Here it tells us, but encourage one another daily as long as it's called today so that none of you may be hardened by sin's deceitfulness. Why? So that our hearts will not get hardened. You know? That our hearts will not get encrusted in the process and become bitter people. We're not meant to be like this, isn't it? Designed by God. God wants us to be tender-hearted people and all the tender-hearted people say, very important for all of us, isn't it? This brother came to church and uh, at the end, I went up to him because in those early days in DMC, they will have a tag on them, okay? A visitor's tag on them. So I went up to him, all right? And I said, welcome. What's your name? Welcome you here to DMC. And then I said, are you a Christian? He says, yes. And then I prayed for him. The power of God hit him, but because he was standing just in front of the pillar, others he would just go down under the power of God. Following Sunday, he came back. I said, it's so good to see you here. Welcome to DMC. But before I could go further, he said, Pastor, please don't come. Pastor, please don't come. Because I'm going to cry already. I'm going to cry already. I said, why do you cry? Do you is a wonderful church, a great church, where everybody is laughing all the time. <laughs> why do you cry? He said, Pastor, since last Sunday you prayed for me, every day I've been crying nonstop. Then came the truth of the story. He says, for the last 25 years, I've dropped off from church. I was very active in church. But for the last 25 years, I have totally backslided and dropped off. And last Sunday was the first time back in church for me after 25 years. And God is working in my heart to make my heart tender and soft again. And I said to him, you know why God is making you to cry? Every day, almost nonstop. God is peeling the layers of hardness from your heart. He is just removing one layer after layer of the hardness that has gathered upon your heart in the last 25 years. That you have been totally insensitive to God since deceitfulness, friends. We think that we can make it in life on our own. We are never designed by God like this to make it on our own. God wants to help us. God wants to enable us and empower us. And good amen for that, isn't it? So friends, why do we encourage one another? So that we're not deceived by sin and therefore led astray by ourselves. And that's why, friends, Apostle Paul says, I labor for the church. I labor for the church in a wonderful way because why my desire, my longing is that at the end of it all, it will result in the well-being of everyone, isn't it? 
Not only Paul's concern is that we all be encouraged and united, encouraged and heart united in love, but also secondly, why right, Paul wants to give everyone a complete understanding, a complete understanding of the riches that they share as Colossian Christians in Christ. Why the second half of verse 2 and verse 3? Let's read together. So that they may have the full riches of complete understanding in all that they may know the mystery of God, namely Christ, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Namely Christ, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Friends, Apostle Paul is concerned to take the Colossian Christians to a place of complete understanding, full understanding, so that when you and I know that full understanding with Christ, that in Christ we have all the inheritance of wisdom, insights, and knowledge. So that, friends, you know, we can only grow one way. We become strong. We become powerful. We become, friends, influential in the world. That's the way God has designed us to live. Never weak, never, friends, incapable of being influenced and impact. God has never designed us to live defeated lives, friends. But to have that and to experience that, it means we must be taken increasingly to a complete understanding in Christ. Can you good amen for that? It's as important. Thirdly, friends, Apostle Paul is concerned that the believers in Colossae would not be deceived in any way whatsoever. And so verse 4, I tell you this, so that no one may deceive you of fine-sounding arguments, because there are all kinds of philosophies in this world, all kinds of teachings, friends. Sometimes they are so deceptive that it's hard to grasp the whole thing in its proper balance. Like, for example, the whole area, if you follow Jesus Christ, you become healthy, wealthy, and happy. How many healthy, wealthy, and happy people here? Can I see your hands? No one, oh my goodness. How many of us want to be healthy, happy, and wealthy people? See your hands. Oh, I see clever people here, isn't it? We all want, who doesn't want? Maybe my two hands should be up, isn't it? Who doesn't want to be healthy, happy, and wealthy people? Everybody wants. How many of you, seriously, seriously, you have really become healthy, happy, or wealthy? At least one of them. Can I see your hand? At least one of them. How many have you become? Hey, come on, I believe it. a lot more hands up, okay. Uh, isn't it? True, when we're in Christ, God blesses us. He really blesses us. God blessed me, for example, with health. When I was much younger, I don't enjoy this kind of health, actually, honestly speaking. When I was much younger, in my early teens, actually, I got arthritis. Shocking. Arthritis is an old man's disease. How can a young man have that? I had that all over my joints. For some 20 years, I wrestled and struggled with that. There are times I cannot lift up my hand. I cannot dress myself because why it is so full of pain and so stiffened. And some 20 years later, after becoming a Christian, I prayed and asked God, Lord, you need to help me. When we started UMC, I still had that. I still wrestle and struggle. I continue to pray, Lord, you help me. Willing to accept if you don't heal me. But Lord, I desire for you to heal. How many of us, we desire God to do something, bring a breakthrough, can I see your hands? All of us is, I pray. Today, friends, I run long distance. I run up the hill. I carry weights. I do all kinds of stuff. No pain whatsoever. That's what God wants to do. Now, all over again, how many of us, we are healthy, happy, and wealthy people? Can I see your hands again? Come, let's see your hands. Okay. God wants to bless us. He is. He is such a God, honestly speaking. I've tasted Him in so many different ways. But friends, to emphasize that if you follow Christ, you will always, always be happy, healthy, and wealthy, and nothing else but that. It is not a balanced picture, isn't it? It is not balanced. How many of us, on the other hand, we have suffered for Christ? See your hands. So few. My goodness, God bless all of you in DMC. Come more to DMC. You will suffer very, very little. Uh, it's right. Maybe that's what Pastor Matt Sola, Pastor, okay? All right, he is here with us. Uh, but friends, the reality is that sometimes in fallen Christ, we do suffer. We do go to our hardships and pains, isn't it? But friends, as we all know, suffering is there to make us stronger and better and never bitter and weaker. 
when we respond to it correctly, isn't it? And that's very important. You heard me preach on Easter weekend, okay, what sufferings will do to all of us. And so, friends, you notice here that we must guard against deceptive teachings that emphasize only on one side only. Because what in the falling of Christ, sometimes there are challenges, problems, and difficulties. Supremely exemplified in Apostle Paul. He is one of the greatest of apostles. And yet he was in prison. And yet he suffered. And yet even in his last days, many of his disciples, they all deserted him. That was a reality. But Paul is willing to go through it all, isn't it? For the sake of Christ. And therefore you and I, friends, must also likewise guard against teachings that are not balanced. And that's important, isn't it? But God's grace is always there for all of us in a mighty manner. That as we follow Christ, as we wrestle and struggle, let the Apostle Paul for Christ, the concern at the end of it all is to make God's people become strong, become wonderful for the Lord Jesus Christ in a powerful manner. And so, friends, that we will not be deceived by wrong teaching, by wrong emphasis. Okay, finally, friends, you notice here, Apostle Paul says his concern in doing all this is for the orderliness, orderliness and firmness of faith. It's for the orderliness and firmness of faith of believers. And so, verse 5 of chapter 2, Paul writes in this manner, For though I'm absent from you in body, I'm present with you in spirit and delight to see how orderly you are and how firm your faith in Christ is. See, Paul is concerned about making us strong, isn't he? He wants to raise up strong disciples of the Lord Jesus Christ, building up us to be the kind of people he wants us to be. And friends, can I say, that's our burden and concern. The one thing you take away from all right, in DMC, it says, we are out to help every one of us to be strong, to be firm, to be steadfast, to be bold for Jesus Christ. Can I hear a good amen from God's people? That's our ultimate concern, friends. And so come each week for worship celebration where we are not only involved in worship of the living God and come on time to worship Him and don't miss the joy, the blessing, the privilege of worshiping God right at the start at 5 o'clock or Sunday morning at 10 o'clock, isn't it? But also, friends, come to receive the teachings that will help us and ground us well. Sign up also, friends, for our school, our leadership, our equip each year. Our purpose is to equip all of us. And we've got many, many trainings every weekend, friends, or sometimes even weekdays as well, weeknights. Sign up for all of these. It is there to help us and build us strong. The third thing you and I must do if we're going to grow strong is belong to a cell group, belong to a small group, isn't it? And we've got over 200 cell groups scattered across the Klang Valley. Be part of one, whereby there's accountability, responsibility, where it's like iron sharpening iron. We urge and we push one another on, all right, in our faith in Christ, isn't it? Very important for all of us. And also conferences and special seminars we organize here. This is all to equip us further. Our lead conference, 2014, it's an important conference for the life of the church, isn't it? For all of us in UMC. Friends, we don't organize conference and training, just keep ourselves busy. Friends, no, no, no. We think, we plan about it very carefully, we invite speakers that will speak to us our lives and take us to the next level of our discipleship, our following of Christ. And so, friends, that's our burden, our concern here in UMC. They're going to help one another to grow strong. What is the purpose? It's not just to be strong for strong sake. It's to build one another up to be strong so that we'll touch Malaysia for Jesus Christ, so they will rock Malaysia for Jesus Christ, so that Malaysia will never be the same again. And God might want to send us further afield to walk alongside with Pastor Matt Sola and Russia to touch and rock Russia for Jesus Christ, rock the, the world for Jesus Christ, friend. And that's so important for all of us, isn't it? Life is very short and time is precious. That if we don't invest ourselves to build ourselves up, we will not be as effective as we can be and we should be. God has never designed a Christian to be a defeated Christian. God has never designed a Christian to be a moon cha cha Christian, a confused Christian, an uncertain Christian. God has designed all of us, friends, to be world changers and history makers. That's His purpose. That's, friends, God's pleasure. And so this evening you say, Lord, here I am. I really want to really move with you in a greater manner. I really want to ride in this crest of your wave to be equipped, to be trained, to go through whatever needful so that, oh God, you help me that I will participate in this amazing changing of world events 
of nation after nation around the world. If that's your heart's desire, I want to ask you to stand wherever you are. We're going to pray and ask God to do this something deep in all our hearts and our lives. So if you desire, will you stand as the worship team comes right uh, to the stage here? As we want to pray and seek the Lord's face and ask God, do something in my heart, do something in my life, do something, oh God, very deeply and powerfully in me so that I will never be the same again. You stand wherever you are. I'm going to pray for all of us before I invite you further, all right, to respond, okay, to all that God wants to do in our hearts, in our lives, and it's so very important. As you stand before God, would you raise up your hands? I'm going to pray first a general prayer, and then later on, I'm going to invite you to step up from your seats and come in front to be prayed for more personally. All right, allow the grace of God to do something very special in all of us. Our hearts desire, friends, that we want to live effective lives for Christ. We want indeed to give our all to Christ. We want indeed to do something that it will, it will really count for God and for God's kingdom. Father, I bring to you, Lord Jesus, all these, my brothers and sisters. Thank you, Father, we can stand together, O oh God, as a body of Christ. Thank you, Father, that you have called us into your kingdom. What an amazing privilege and joy. Oh God, what an honor indeed to be part of this kingdom of yours that will last forever and ever. And Father, you are inviting us to share in it, oh God, to share, Father, in an everlasting kingdom, in a kingdom, Father, that will surpass and outlast everything else in this world. And so, Father, I pray you anoint all of us, oh God, with your power. It is by your energy, Father, oh God, we will be able to do something for you, for your kingdom, Father, I pray. Lord, inspire all of us in you. Equip all of us with gifts that are needful. We need, oh God, all the gifts and the graces from you, Father, I pray. So that together, oh God, as a people of yours, we'll be equipped more and more. We'll be prepared in a greater way, Father. So that together, oh God, we'll be all servants of Christ. Together, oh God, we'll reach out to touch people around us, to touch society, to be a blessing around. So that, Father, we pray, this world will may never be the same again. Thank you for the opportunity of lifetime you've given us to live, oh God, in this season of time. Okay, and at this point of history, Father, and I pray you will help us all. Whether here in Malaysia, in Russia, wherever you put us in, oh God, I pray, Father, that you will use us, oh God, as we surrender and submit ourselves to you. Do it again anew afresh in our lives, Father, I pray. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord.